We want to start this. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar on Hispanic families experiences of childcare closures during COVID-19. My name is Maria Ramos de la Zagasi, and I lead the building capacity activities of the National Research Center on Hispanic Children and Families, and I'm delighted to be facilitating this webinar today. Before we begin, I'd like to go over some logistics. All attendees are going to be muted throughout the webinar. However, you can type in questions for the panelists in the question box. And finally, this webinar will be recorded and available on our website later. So please um, check it out and share with your networks if you like what you hear today. Also, please tweet. We're going to be live tweeting. And when you do so, use the hashtag NRCH Comunidad and our Twitter handle at NRC Hispanic in your tweets. Also an important note that the views expressed in this presentation do not necessarily reflect the views of our funder, the Office of Planning, Research and Evaluation, and the Administration for Children and Families, or the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. So with that, we're ready to start. So as we all know, childcare doesn't always provide an excellent, doesn't only, sorry, provide an excellent opportunity for children to learn and socialize, but it also plays a critical role in promoting employment opportunities for families. Millions of families, myself included, depend on childcare to be able to work. However, when COVID hit, these employment supports disappeared for many overnight. And as many of you have probably experienced, it had a, this had a huge impact on how families with young children organize their lives and their ability to do work. And just to give you an idea, a recent report by the Urban Institute showed that one in five adults living with young children worked fewer hours in 2020 because of increased caregiving responsibilities. While it is true that there have been childcare closures, closures across the country, Childcare closures are particularly hard on Latino families because of the characteristics of the jobs that many Latino workers have. For example, a third of Hispanic workers are in frontline occupations, and only about 16% of Latino workers have the option of working from home. So childcare is quite a critical um, support for this population, as a large proportion isn't able to um, take care of their children while they work, while they work at home. Hispanic workers are also overrepresented in low wage jobs that are less likely to offer paid leave. This means that when childcare closes, they have less available income to find other childcare arrangements, and they may experience a loss in wages by not going to work to take care of their children. So, as you can see, Hispanic families are particularly vulnerable when childcare centers close. And this is why we need to pay attention to the impact of these closures on Latino families and well, why we're gathered here today. Of course, the Hispanic population is incredibly diverse and so are their experiences with childcare closures and the resources available to them. Um, so I wanna acknowledge that. And in that note, I also wanna note that here we're gonna be using the terms Latino, Hispanic and Latinx interchangeably. So today we're going to talk about how Hispanic families have experienced childcare closures or disruptions during COVID. Specifically, we'll start with a descriptive report of childcare closures during COVID-19 that'll help us understand the magnitude nationwide of these closures and the disproportionate impact of these closures on specific communities, including the Latino community. We'll also hear about how childcare disruptions affect Hispanic families' work income and overall well-being. We have a wonderful group of panelists today. We'll start with Emma Lee, who's a senior at Columbia University working with Dr. Zach Perolin and his lab. And he, you'll see that they're using very innovative methods to um, capture and track childcare closures throughout the country using modern technology. We're also delighted to have Dr. Kevin Ferreira Van Leer, who's an alumni of the Hispanic Center's Research Scholar Program and a wonderful contributor to center work, including the work that he's going to be sharing today. He's an assistant professor in child and adolescent development at California State University, Sacramento. We're also very fortunate to have our very own Dr. Danielle Crosby, who co-leads the Hispanic Center's Early Care and Education Research Area. She's an Associate Professor in Human Development and Family Studies at the University of North Carolina, Greensboro. And she'll offer some reflections and a discussion tying the research presented here to the broader field. 
And last but not least, we're joined by Dr. Zach Brolin, who co-authored the work that Emma will be presenting, and will be joining our discussion and answering questions about their work. He's a senior research fellow at the Center on Poverty and Social Policy at Columbia University and assistant professor at Bocconi University. And with that, I'll turn it over to Emma, who's going to be presenting on findings from a study using tracking data to estimate the care burden during COVID-19. Thank you, Maria, for your introduction. Um, I'm so glad to be here today to share our research with you all. Um, at the Center on Poverty and Social Policy, we've been using cell phone tracking data to look at school and child care closures. Um, today, I will be sharing our research on disparities in child care closures across America throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. So the majority of families with young children in America have been impacted by child care closures over the past year and a half, but some have been affected more than others. So in particular, I will discuss the geographic, demographic, and socioeconomic disparities in access to child care, with an emphasis on the disproportionate share of child care center closures affecting the Latino community. There are three underlying motivations for this study. First is the ongoing COVID-19 health crisis. Second is the employment crisis. So in April 2020, after the onset of the pandemic, unemployment reached 15% in the United States. This is an 11.5% rise in unemployment compared to the pre-crisis level of only 3.5%. By April and May 2020, the share of children with unemployed parents also reached record highs. Inequalities in unemployment have widened between women and men. In particular, disparities in parental unemployment were exacerbated by the child care crisis, disproportionately affecting the employment of mothers. The last motivation for this study is the care crisis. So to prevent the spread of COVID-19, many child care centers in the U.S. shut down or greatly reduced capacity in April 2020. By fall of 2020, there was significant variation in closure of child care centers across the U.S. The closure of child care centers was likely necessary for virus prevention, but it came with consequences for parents struggling to manage care and work responsibilities, child development dependent on quality of care, and employment of thousands of child care workers in the U.S. The three main questions that our research aims to address are first, how many child care centers are closed or operating at significantly reduced capacity? Second, what are the geographic, demographic, and socioeconomic disparities in exposure to child care center closure? And third, in particular, to what extent are Hispanic families exposed to child care center closures? So as a preview, here are some results that show exposure to child care closures by race ethnicity from January 2020 to April 2021. The smooth black line represents the national average, and we see that white families indicated by the light gray line are affected by child care closures less than the average U.S. family. In contrast, racial ethnic minority families shown by the blue, red, and dark gray lines for Black, Latino, and Asian families respectively tend to experience rates of child care closure at or above the national average. We will continue to see throughout our data that families are not all affected equally by child care closure. So how do we measure and track the capacity of child care centers? Today, most people have cell phones that carry a lot of information, including GPS data that can track one's movement and location. So for our research, we primarily use this anonymized aggregated mobile phone tracking data. SafeGraph is a data company that provides us with data from more than 40 million mobile phone users to over 6.5 million physical locations. And when focusing only on child care centers in America, we are able to track movement to over 85,000 child care centers across over 2,000 U.S. counties. This data set gives us an estimated coverage rate of about 78% of all licensed child care centers, making this the broadest among all available data sets. Using SafeGraph data, we identify the total number of visits made to a specific child care center per month from January 2019 to August 2021. However, what we do not see due to the anonymization of data is information on the characteristics of the mobile phone users themselves. So to estimate characteristics of the individuals studied, we use descriptive data of each census tract in which each child care center is located. 
And how do we identify a childcare center that is closed or at reduced capacity? So for each individual childcare center, we take the total in-person visits in a given month and compare this value to the total number of in-person visits in the same month of 2019, which we use as representing pre-pandemic visit rates. Um, so for example, if we were to look at the child care center kinder care in St. Louis, we'd see that they had 500 total visits in April 2019 before the pandemic. But this number drops to just 50 visits in April 2020 at the peak of the pandemic. So we would say that this child care center experienced a 90% decline in in-person visits. For each child care center, if in-person visits declined by 50% or more in any given month, then we would label the child care center as closed. So kinder care with a 90% decline in in-person attendance would therefore be labeled as closed in April 2020. This process was repeated for the over 85,000 different child care centers tracked in our data set. As mentioned previously, SafeGraph anonymized data provides the name and geographic location of each child care center, but does not include the characteristics of mobile phone users being tracked. So to estimate the characteristics of families using these child care services, we use census data that provides descriptive data of each U.S. census tract. By combining SafeGraph data with county level indicators, we can determine the characteristics of the families and children most likely to be affected by child care closures in the U.S. And we see that child care center closure impact varies by race, ethnicity, income, single parent status, and other characteristics. For the next half of the presentation, I will dive into our results and findings. So in this first figure, we see the national trend in the share of child care centers with at least a 50% year over year decline in in-person visits. On the X axis, we have each month from January, 2020 to April, 2021. And on the Y axis, we have the percent of child care centers characterized as closed. The black line represents the percent of child care centers that experienced at least 50% year over year decline in in-person visits over time. And we see varying levels of reduced capacity in 10% increments above 50% closure as indicated by the various shades of gray. For example, the darkest shade of gray shows the share of child care centers with the 50 to 60% decline while the lightest shade of gray shows the share of childcare centers with a 90 to 100% decline in in-person visits. We see that the first major peak in childcare closure occurs in April, 2020, with almost 70% of childcare centers having greater than a 50% decline in in-person visits. This peak closely aligns with the first wave of COVID-19 cases in the US when many states were issuing mandatory stay-at-home orders. By April 2021, the percentage of closed child care centers had decreased to one third of all centers. And we also see a slight rise in closure in December 2020, possibly due to a new wave of COVID-19 cases in the U.S. in December. Overall, we see significant rates of child care closure over the course of the pandemic, with the greatest rate of closure in April 2020 at the peak of the pandemic. Here we see the geographic distribution of child care closure across the US from April 2020 to April 2021. We notice significant variation in the coloring of this map, indicating differences in child care closure across counties. So for each county, um, it is color coded according to the average decline in in person attendance across child care centers in that given county. The darkest shaded counties experienced 15% or more decline in in person visits while the lightest shaded counties experience less than a 20% decline in visits. We also see some gray shaded counties. Um, we did not have any mobile tracking data for child care centers in these counties. Counties with particularly high child care center closure rates appear to be concentrated along the coasts of California, Oregon, and Washington, as well as along the northeastern coast. Um, there are fewer child care center closures in the middle of the U.S., but counties with 40% or greater closure are also scattered throughout the Midwest, generally around large population clusters like major cities. In contrast, some states such as Hawaii, Wyoming, and Maine express relatively low closure rates, with all studied counties in these states having less than 50% child care closure from April 2020 to April 2021. Here we revisit the initial figure I showed in more detail. So for all racial ethnic groups, we see similar trends from January 2020 to April 2021. In particular, we notice the characteristic peak in childcare closure in April 2020, 
But despite the comparable trends over time, there remain persistent differences in levels of exposure to childcare closure for each racial ethnic group. For example, in April 2021, 27.5% of white families were exposed to childcare closures, while 40.1% of Latino families were exposed to childcare closures. From March 2020 onward, white families have been affected by less childcare closures than the national average, while Latino, Black, and Asian families have been exposed to childcare closures to a much greater extent. For the next four slides, we will see binned scatter plots of childcare closure rates for a variety of characteristics. For each plot, the average monthly percentage of closed childcare centers from April 2020 through April 2021 is plotted on the y-axis, while the x-axis includes 10 points representing the mean values of each decile for the given characteristic. In the plot shown on this slide, the leftmost point represents the mean closure rate of the census tracts with the lowest share of white families. In these census tracts, over 50% of all childcare centers were closed. In comparison, the highest decile, as represented by the rightmost point, shows the mean closure rate for census tracts with the greatest share of white families. These census tracts experienced a closure rate closer to only 30% of all childcare centers. In general, we see that as the share of white families increases, the share of closed child care centers decreases, indicating a negative correlation. In other words, non-white families are particularly exposed to child care closures. In contrast with the previous slide of white families, we now see a positive correlation between child care closure and share of Latino families in a census tract. This means that as the share of Latino families increases, as do child care closure rates. So on the far right of the plot, we see that the child care centers serving the greatest share of Latino families show a closure rate close to 54%, whereas census tracts with the lowest share of Latino families on the left side of the subplot show closure, closure rates closer to only 30%. And we also see similar trends for the share of Asian families in census tracts. This next plot shows a U-shaped relationship between the share of families in poverty and the child care closure rates in a census tract. This indicates that the census tracts with the lowest and highest shares of families in poverty also experience the greatest child care closure rates. The lack of a linear relationship indicates that there is a rather complex combination of factors that may be influencing disparities in child care closures. For this last slide of results, we plot the share of closed child care centers by population density measured in units of number of residents per square mile. We see a positive correlation between population density and child care closure rates. This means that the most densely populated census tracts tend to have greater rates of child care closure. This makes sense given our knowledge of the spread of COVID and necessity for social distancing. Due to the tendency of large high density urban areas to have greater racial ethnic diversity and a larger resultant share of racial ethnic minority families, it is likely that population density contributed to the increased child care closure rates seen among Latino families compared to white families. In conclusion, there are large geographic, demographic, and socioeconomic disparities in exposure to child care center closures in the U.S. Hispanic families experience particularly high rates of exposure, far above the national average. These disparities risk the widening of pre-existing disparities in access to the already limited supply of childcare services in the U.S. This may translate into further inequalities in parental unemployment, child development, and the survival of childcare centers. We hope that our findings will spur future research, and to facilitate this, we make our data publicly available. This data is updated monthly and provides estimates on the share of child care centers that exhibit 25, 50, and 75% declines in in-person visits at the census tract, county, and state levels. My co-author and research mentor, Zachary Perlin, and I would like to thank the Hispanic Center for having us today. Thank you so much, Emma, for that wonderful presentation. It's great to see how cell phone tracking data is being used in social science research to help us understand the magnitude of um, child care closures and how it affects different communities. Now I'm going to turn it over to Kevin, who's going to share some of his research on the effect of child care closures on Hispanic families. Thank you, Maria. Hi, all. I'm excited to be here with you today. Again, my name is Kevin Ferreira Van Leer, and I'm Assistant Professor in Child and Adolescent Development at California State University, Sacramento, and a former research scholar with the Hispanic Center. 
Building off of the tremendous research by Emma and Zach, I hope to help paint a picture of what Hispanic families experienced when child care centers closed or were disrupted over COVID. To set the stage, I think it's helpful to think about the ways that families navigate work and care as a puzzle. One, where families are trying to fit the pieces of work schedules and care responsibilities together, something that many of us intimately know. My apologies. Some tech issues on my side. All right. To paint a picture of the experience and consequence of care work disruptions for Latinx families during COVID, I actually want to begin by discussing what we know about disruptions for these families from research in 2012. By starting in 2012, we might get a better idea of why Latino families were disproportionately impacted, and it may help us as we look forward. These data are drawing from the 2012 National Study of Early Care and Education, which looks at the availability of childcare, characteristics of childcare providers, and how families with children under the age of 13 use childcare. We focus on data from the household survey of the NSCCE, which interviewed an adult member of the household to learn more about their employment information, schedules of adults in the home, within the home, and child care arrangements they used. The sample is nationally representative, drawing from all 50 states and the District of Columbia. In other words, they're trying to get, gather a, natural port, a national portrait of child care for families. Our analysis focused on low-income households with children under the age of 13 who reported using child care for any child in the home. For the purposes of the study, we defined low-income households as those households with an annual income below 20 or 200% of the federal poverty threshold, which in 2012 is approximately 46,000 for a family of four. I focus here on a sample that includes about 2,200 low-income Hispanic households. As we can see, the figure here shows a percentage of low-income Latinx households who reported a care work disruption in a three-month period in 2012. On the left, we can see that 26% of immigrant Hispanic families experienced a disruption, and on the right, 30% of non-immigrant Hispanic households. You may be asking what we mean by a disruption to child care and what that looked like in 2012. This may mean that a child care provider was sick and closed, or that trans transportation to the child care center for families broke down. The respondent reported on specific types of disruption. For example, they made a, a special arrangement for child care. They worked from home to watch their child, arrived late or left early from work, or missed a day more or more of work. Overall, we see that one quarter of Hispanic households have reported experiencing a disruption in the coordination of work and care over three months. Over three months. In other words, care work disruptions were common among Hispanic low-income families in 2012, even before COVID. Further, we were able to learn from respondents how often these disruptions occurred over that, those last three months. Here we see that for low-income households that experienced a disruption, these disruptions were frequent. Looking at the striped purple and spotted green sections of the figure, we see that those who went through a disruption ex reported experiencing this on or for more than five days during that three-month period. This is the equivalent of experiencing a disruption for a total of one work week or more during each quarter or three-month period. In other words, for those families who went through a disruption, these disruptions were happening regularly for many of these families. So now let's talk about how those disruptions impacted their financial well-being. Starting on the left-hand side of the slide, households reported that whether, that whether child care work disruptions lost pay as a result of that disruption. Specifically, those having missed a day of work as seen in the orange bars or arriving late or leaving work early as seen in the purple stripes were asked whether they, whether they were lost, they lost pay as a result. Here we found that among those households who reported missing a day of work, again, those orange bars, at least 65% lost pay as a result. We find that at least 56% of, of these households um, across nativity, nativity status for low-income Latinx families lost pay as a result as well, as shown in those purple striped bars. Overall, nearly half of these Latinx low-income households who experienced a disruption that impeded their work schedule lost pay as a result. On the right hand of the screen, we try to estimate what this means for a low-income Latino family. In the state of Pennsylvania, a building cleaner would lose an average of $11.52 for every hour of work missed time, or $100 a day for work missed. 
missing 20 days would result in losing approximately $1,800. For context, the average income for a low income Hispanic family in the NSECE sample was 22,000. This research from 2012 demonstrates that for low income Latino families, disruptions were common and frequent and for many had financial consequences. As you can see, Latino families, particularly low income Hispanic families, already struggled with the puzzle of fitting childcare and work arrangements together and were on shaky grounds. I'm gonna now turn to a more recent analysis which provides a closer look at the disruptions during COVID-19. So let's fast forward from 2012 to this year, 2021. These data are drawn from the Household Pulse, census Sur uh, Household Pulse Survey, a Census Bureau initiative that gathers nationally representative data on how the COVID pandemic has impacted households and individuals within the US. Our sample includes approximately 37,000 households with children under 18 who reported whether, whether the pandemic impacted their childcare between April 14th and June 7th, 2021. As a reminder, that was this spring or this last spring when many schools and childcare centers were opening up for many. Those who reported a disruption reported on their approaches to those disruptions. It's important to note that this data includes families of all incomes, not only low income families. First, households with children under 18 were asked whether their child was unable to attend daycare or another child care arrangement in the last four weeks because of the coronavirus pandemic. Respondents were asked between April 14th and June 7th, capturing circumstances from mid-March to early June when most K-12 schools were still in session. Those families who reported a disruption were asked about the resulting approach as listed in the green square on the right-hand side. Families who reported a disruption were asked whether, in order to care for their children, any adult in the household, including themselves, used vacation, sick days, or other paid leave, cut hours, left or lost a job, supervised one or more children while working, or other. Respondents were able to select all those responses that applied to their circumstances. In mid to late spring 2021, Looking at the orange bar all the way on the left, we see that roughly one in five households with children reported a childcare disruption due to the pandemic. Again, as a reminder, in spring 2021, one year into the pandemic, many schools were reopening or had reopened. For purposes of the webinar, I also want to point your attention to that second bar in from the left, which shows us that 22% of Latinos reported a disruption during those weeks. For those that reported disruption caused by the pandemic, there were disruptions to the adults' work lives. Here we can see how the disruptions played out in the everyday lives for adults one year into the pandemic. For Latino families represented here in purple, we can see the resulting approaches to that, those disruptions. Starting on the left-hand most column, we can see that under just under one in four Latinos who experienced a disruption left or lost their job. Furthermore, 21% of Latinos cut their work hours. This means that for those Latinos who went through a disruption in the pandemic in late spring 2021, the resulting strategies had an impact to their employment and finances for more than one fifth of families. If we continue over uh, to the right, we see that 23% of Latinos supervised children while working and 17% used paid leave. Now we'll look at the approaches taken by, by Latinos side by side with their racial and ethnic counterparts. Here we see the resulting approaches for all racial and ethnic groups examined. Here we see that Latino, black and white households with children varied significantly in their approaches to COVID related childcare disruptions. In the figure, Latino households are represented in purple, black houses in blue or green, depending on how it's on your screen and white in the orange stripes. Starting on the left, we can see that Latino and black households are more likely to have left or lost their job in response to the disruption than white families. Continuing to the right, we see that Latino and Black households cut hours, supervise children while working, and use paid leave less as an adjustment to the pandemic-related disruption than white families. Latino and Black individuals are overrepresented in low-wage jobs and jobs that do not offer paid benefits or telework options, as Maria mentioned in the introduction, likely helping us understand the lower use of supervising children while working and using paid leave by these families. In summary, we can see that across the figure that all families took approaches that impacted their work lives. 
But as we see, the options taken for these families were not the same, with Latino households using paid leave and supervising children while working less than their white counterparts. As a summary so far, we know that for many families, childcare and work is a puzzle they're trying to fit together. In taking that bird's eye view, we found that more than one in five Latino households reported their children were unable to attend daycare or childcare through the pandemic in late spring 2021. And during those weeks, about a quarter left or lost their job. To better help contextualize those disruptions, I'll turn to preliminary findings from a study that spoke directly with families. We go from a nationally representative snapshot on childcare disruptions to preliminary findings from a collaborative research project between university researchers and leadership within a small urban district in Massachusetts, where approximately one third of kindergarten families identify as Hispanic. This research project provides a descriptive look at patterns of care settings um, for children in the year prior to, the uh, prior to kindergarten. We interviewed 25 kindergarten parents and complemented this data with survey data and administrative data. Now we'll hear what these disruptions were like for many families. Drawing from the survey, the vast majorities of families reported their child care programs closed in March 2020. For many that didn't close, parents pulled their children out of care due to health and safety concerns, meaning that child care disruptions were nearly universal at the start of the pandemic. In interviews with a subset of these families, we were able to have parents walk us through their child care arrangements for children in the household from fall 2019, which was before the onset of the pandemic, through summer 2021, or just this past summer. This allowed us to gather a holistic picture of care arrangements throughout the pandemic for these households, providing us greater depth into the role of the pandemic on child care disruptions than the household poll survey, which was at one time point one year into the pandemic. We learned that the majority of these families continued to manage their care at home, often by themselves during summer 2020. One mother shared, quote, I think they opened back up in June, but that at that point, we had all of these different situations happening. We went from having all three kids in daily programs to then all three kids at home with us. We didn't rely on family during that period at all because it was so unknown, end quote. As the pandemic, as the pandemic continued into summer, Families describe certain uncertainty over how to navigate care at home with increasing recognition that the pandemic was continuing and learning environments would continue with remote learning in the fall. Interviews revealed a continually changing landscape of care and work arrangements that led to multiple changes and disruptions throughout the first year and a half of COVID. Many of the Latino families we interviewed were furloughed or were not able to continue jobs at the start of the pandemic. As the work and school situations changed in response to the pandemic in fall 2020, so did those disruptions. Families began finding new puzzle pieces, leaving older siblings to care for their young, younger siblings, both remote learning, parents filling in if they had days off from work or could help, paying tutors to support Zoom and remote learning. Another family shared these changes, quote, well, we weren't able to go to daycare anymore. I don't recall exactly how many months, but during that time, I was furloughed for three months. So I was with them, with her for a month, then three months, and then my oldest had to stay home with my little one. And during that time, there were two days where my mom had the day off, so she would stay with her as well. This shows how families had multiple changes and disruptions throughout care in COVID. As the pandemic continued through spring 2021, families described the reopening process for schools as creating new disruptions, with families navigating drop-offs, changing from hybrid to full day, and managing their work schedules. Again, new puzzle pieces emerged where families hired someone who can help bring their child to school once it reopened and pick them up after care uh, until they returned home from work. Briefly, I will also share that throughout these interviews, families spoke about disruptions with concern for children and themselves. Across the board, families shared that disruptions were difficult they noted changes within the household, including observing changes in how they and their children were responding to disruptions. This included noting positive and negative changes in behavior, both within themselves and within the household unit um, if, as they navigated these disruptions. In the pandemic, they also described their own isolation and isolation for their children. Families described also creating new opportunities to connect. One family sharing, creating a text group over WhatsApp, called Padres Latinos, where quickly the group blossomed from 12 to over 100 parents sharing strategies for childcare, as well as their concerns with different approaches 
to taking care of their children during the pandemic. And for time, I will wrap it up quickly. In sum, we know that for many families that childcare and work is a puzzle that they're trying to fit together. What we found is more than one in five Latino families reported childcare disruptions due to COVID in spring 2021. And during those week, about a quarter lost or left their job. We learned from interviews that these disruptions likely cascaded throughout the pandemic as families navigated changes in work and care situations. Together, these data reveal that the consequences of this pandemic and disruptions like it have for family, leading to the puzzle crumbling when families can't get to work or care for their children. And with that, I would like to thank you for listening. And you can find my contact information on the screen as well as links to the Hispanic Center if you'd like to reach out and learn more. And I'll now turn it back over to Maria. Thank you so much, Kevin. That really helped us um, see how oftentimes carefully planned childcare arrangements can fall apart over and over again, but how families are able to um, figure it out and rely on each other to make it work. Um, I'm going to now turn it over to Dr. Danielle Crosby, who's going to help us make sense of all this research that's been shared today by putting it into context and help us identify how to move forward. Danielle? Thank you, Maria. And thank you, Emma, Zach, and Kevin for sharing your insightful work. I really appreciate the multiple vantage points that this collection of studies brings to the conversation. So I'd like to begin my comments with just a few big picture reflections before considering how do we move forward from here. So inequitable systems and structures have long required low-wage working parents, especially in Black, Brown, and immigrant families, to coordinate employment and caregiving under precarious circumstances in order to support their families and the U.S. economy. Prior to the pandemic, work from the Hispanic Research Center and other scholars shows that low-income Hispanic families managed to maintain relatively strong labor force attachment despite considerable challenges to fitting together this work care puzzle that Kevin mentioned. Um, challenges include insufficient community supply of licensed care providers. So prior to 2020, we know that nearly 60% of Latino families lived in child care deserts. Um, also, non-standard parental work hours and short advance notice of work schedule, uh, high out-of-pocket child care costs, and then as Kevin described, care work disruptions that often resulted in missed work and missed pay. The pandemic has only served to exacerbate existing racial, ethnic, and SES-based disparities, with Hispanic parents overrepresented among frontline workers, but also among those who have left the workforce, especially Latina mothers, as well as being overrepresented in communities with childcare closures and as part of the early care and education workforce. So I raised this last point because women of color make up roughly 40% of childcare providers. So when we consider how Hispanic families have been impacted by pandemic related care disruptions and job loss, I think it's important to remember those working in this sector. In fact, there's some evidence that Latino and black owned childcare centers have been especially vulnerable to closures and may have experienced greater barriers to accessing small business relief. So as recovery efforts roll out at the federal, state, and local level, there's considerable discussion right now about a window of opportunity that we might have to do more than simply return to the pre-pandemic circumstances that stressed and strained so many families, and to instead build more effective, more equitable, and more sustainable supports and infrastructure for Hispanic families who are coordinating employment and caregiving. And one helpful framework that I'd like to mention that could be used to help guide policy and practice decisions is one that recognizes the multiple linked components of meaningful childcare access. Uh, so that is care that is available to families with reasonable effort, childcare that is affordable, care that supports children's developmental needs, but also meets a, a range of what families need, um, including things like parents' work schedule, um, and language and concerns about safety. That's just a few examples. So this conceptualization of childcare access is often used to consider how parents find and secure childcare arrangements, but I think it's also useful for considering what families need to maintain care over time. So informed by this framework, I'd like to highlight just a few evidence-based recommendations for how we can begin to recalibrate and enable families to better coordinate employment and caregiving while also supporting their health and well-being. Uh, 
Um, I believe Kevin mentioned families need for both flexibility and stability. And though I know very little about architecture, it struck me that often physical structures need to be designed with both of those goals in mind to maintain their strength. And that this takes intentional planning and attention to how different elements fit together. Um, so while I don't wanna push this analogy too far, uh, I'd like to make the broader point that the strategies I'm mentioning should be considered as part of a comprehensive approach. Um, one such strategy is to expand the federal and state child care assistance that already exists in order to help more families be able to afford child care. Um, publicly funded preschool programs already serve a substantial number of Hispanic children. However, these programs do not always fully cover working parents' child care needs, and only a small percentage of eligible, eligible Hispanic children are served currently by the CCDF child care subsidy program. Um, in addition to expanded funding, it would help to make childcare assistance more flexible, especially as we emerge from the pandemic and continue to deal with its impacts. So to the extent that benefits are less dependent on parents' work status and hours and cover a broad range of arrangements, they may better support parents, especially mothers who are trying to reestablish employment. We also need to ensure that the recovery safety net is more inclusive to serve all families. Many of the same types of barriers that we know interfered with some Hispanic families' access to services pre-pandemic have led them to be excluded from emergency relief and recovery supports, and this has been especially true for families within immigrant households. And last but not least, it's important to attend to the employment side of this equation. Um, and promote family-friendly workplace policies that help mitigate disruptions and support greater continuity for parents and children um, and employers, such as paid leave and more employee-centered scheduling practices. And new investments and policy strategies will also be critical in the childcare sector. So without significant intervention, disruptions and closures are likely to persist as providers and programs struggle with reopening that has happened in fits and starts and stops, um, increased costs and decreased revenues, permanent closures and staffing shortages. And as we've, as we've heard today, all of this instability has significant consequences for families. Additional public investment should help stabilize, sustain, and build up childcare supply, especially in Black, Brown, and immigrant communities. So the challenging economics of childcare that many, us, many of us may be familiar with, where wages are low and benefits are few um, for providers, but costs are often very high for parents, um, have only worsened during the pandemic. And we know this is not the winning formula for promoting the high quality, stable early care and education that can benefit both children and parents. And new investments should target supply gaps in particular that have only widened during the pandemic. So for example, providers that offer non-standard hours and care for infants and toddlers. Then in terms of growing and supporting the ECE workforce specifically to improve capacity, stability, and quality of care, strategies are needed that promote livable wages and benefits, build capacity for culturally and linguistically responsive services, increase professional development and supports related to health and mental health. And um, I think it's important to emphasize that I'm thinking of both for providers, but also for the children and the families that they serve, um, all of whom have, who have endured um, considerable stress, transition, uncertainty, and trauma um, at the intersection of the three crises that Emma mentioned in her talk. We think about the health crisis, the employment crisis, and the, the childcare crisis. Uh, and finally, I recommend strategies that extend resources, training, and supports to more home-based providers to provide critical services to so many low-wage working parents and the, who have helped to fill the gaps during the pandemic. So finally, I'd like to just wrap up my comments with some thoughts about general next steps for research in this area, though I'd love to hear additional thoughts about this from both our panelists and the audience. Um, first, we should ensure that data is being collected that can help track the ongoing impacts of the pandemic and recovery efforts from an equity lens. Uh, so some of these data needs include demographic data related to service provision across states and local communities. And there may be interesting opportunities here to combine those types of data with the innovative data that was described by Emma and Zach. Um, we also need data that allows for a more holistic assessment of access 
Um, so ways that we can examine uh, reasonable effort, affordability, and care that meets child and parent needs, but in combination with one another. Um, and I'd also like to see additional studies that can inform building childcare supply that meets what Hispanic families need and want, with particular attention to the substantial heterogeneity that exists within the pan-ethnic Latinx population as well as research that can help design policies and practices that support the resourcefulness of families in coordinating work and caregiving. Um, it was fascinating to hear Kevin talk about how communities use WhatsApp to share information and strategies. And it also seems that community-based organizations may be an undertapped resource uh, that can help broker connections between Hispanic families and services. Finally, I believe that many of these next steps will benefit from greater incorporation of community engaged and community informed methods, which can help center the voices of Latinx families and child care providers, as well as other stakeholders. So with that, I'll end my comments to leave this time for discussion. Um, we would love to hear your questions and comments, so please submit those in the chat. And we'll get to as many as possible in our time left today, but we're also collecting those so that we can reflect on them after the webinar. Okay, and I will start us off with a couple questions for our panelists. Um, so Emma and Zach, do you have thoughts about the increased childcare closures in communities with a large proportion of Latinos? Yes, so um, we're thinking that there is significant closure in Latino communities, uh, mostly due to geographic disparities. Um, it's due to the higher chance of urban areas and very densely populated areas of having racial ethnic diversity. Um, this could potentially be an explanation as to why we see higher rates of closure in Latino communities. And I would only add that, uh, that that the disparities we see are appear to be showing up in other dimensions as well. Kevin talked about several of them in, in his presentation, but we see disparities in employment outcomes. We're seeing disparities in food hardship and poverty rates among Latino families relative to, to other families. And I, I think the overarching theme from these presentations is that these are all connected to the challenges of care and employment and trying to, as Kevin mentioned, put all these pieces of the puzzle uh, together uh, at mm -hmm. once. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I think as we continue to try to track these disparities and um, you know, know what's going on in communities, I was just wondering a follow-up question for Emma and Zach about the potential of these types of data um, it's great to hear that you're updating that particular data set and I just wondered if you had thoughts or recommendations about how um, those data might be used by others or in combination with other data. Yeah, so a few ideas we had about further research that this data could be used for um, mainly focus on family outcomes and uh, examples could be parental unemployment, um, the transition back to work, uh, child development, child learning, um, but we do make our data set available so that uh, various influences can come in and use our data um, with research projects that they are working on. Mm -hmm. Exactly, so if you're out there and you have an idea of testing, you know, the effects of exposure to childcare closures on certain outcomes that you have data for, we, we do encourage you to use our data set uh, you can Google it or find our presentation and have access to it. And our, our goal is that uh, researchers, scholars, policymakers out there can use this in any way they see fit to help inform social and economic conditions across the, the country right now, particularly for uh, Latino families. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have a couple follow-up questions specifically about those data. So um, one is about the potential to add child care license ownership by race and ethnicity to the data set, uh, whether that would be possible or I don't know if that's available at the census tract level. It is challenging to get much more 
granular with respect to the types of child care centers we see in our data set. The information we start with is simply the name of the child care center and its geographic location. And so to move beyond that and, and categorize them into uh, different types of centers based on whichever characteristics uh, might be interesting is, is just challenging from a data management perspective with 100,000 centers. We can't do it manually, so we would need some extra data set to try to merge in. And just technically, it's a very challenging thing to pull off. But to your point, that would, if, if we could do that, it would, of course, be a, a useful resource beyond what's currently available. Thank you. I also noted that um, from the audience, there was a question of clarification um, about how the child care centers were identified um, and just clarifying that it did not include smaller, unlicensed or informal home providers. Is that right? Yeah, so our data only includes um, licensed child care providers um, that are labeled with an NAICS code as a child care center. So that doesn't include more informal care based services or any location without a child care license. Um, there's a question for Kevin. Um, in some of the data that you presented, the largest proportion of Latino families selected other um, as an approach when asked how they navigated child care closures. And the question is about whether you did families describe what else they did. So what's included in that other category? Yeah, thank you for that question. And I think it's an astute question. So about one quarter of families also uh, of Latino families also selected other. And unfortunately, they did not describe what other looks like. Um, and so we can only th I think through other projects going on, we might be able to get a sense of what those other approaches look like. But from this data specifically, they did not respond to that, unfortunately. Um, also, an, a follow-up question about the Pulse data. Um, the submitter notes that uh, from their familiarity or their sense of the Pulse data that it had low response rates, so that it relies a lot of, on imputation. Um, and just whether that has implications for how well um, Latino and Hispanic families are represented in those data. And so whether you just have any thoughts on that. I, I appreciate the question and I apologize that I won't be able to go in depth. And we've just released this snapshot on the Hispanic Center website. So there's more information on the methodology there. Um, I, I, I as far as response rate, I know that we felt comfortable presenting the data um, as, as we went forward. I don't have the numbers around imputed data in front of me, but that's something that I'm more than happy to follow up if, if folks want to reach out to me over email or any of the other authors from the Hispanic Center. But I appreciate the question. Um... I have a question for Emma and Zach about whether you conducted any analyses to verify the assumption that reduced activity at a center in fact reflects closure, um, since a reduction in visits could reflect changes in families' use of care during the crisis. Mm. Yep, so there's a, a couple things uh, we've done. First, when we do talk about closures, uh, as, as, as uh, Emma noted a few times in the presentation, we are referring broadly to closures or reduced capacity. And the person posing this question is absolutely right that this reduced capacity could, in reality, just be that fewer families are sending their children to formal child care centers, perhaps due to their own assessment of the risk of uh, the virus uh, and so on. Uh, that's certainly possible. In many other cases, through our cross checks, we've been able to establish pretty clearly that the centers that see strong reductions in capacity, according to our data, are indeed those that are, particularly during the early parts of the uh, pandemic, are indeed those that were required to shut down or place capacity limits on their work. We've also done some work on school closures and uh, a separate study. And there we were able to validate across uh, I forget how many tens of thousands of schools and also found that our data were uh, reliable and, and assessing based on our 50% benchmark of, of closure, whether those schools were indeed closed. And in, across that data set as well, we found evidence to support 
the, uh, the claims made here. So we're pretty comfortable in making these claims, but the, the person posing the question is absolutely right, that it could also reflect to some extent uh, apprehension on behalf of the families for sending their children. Thank you. Um, and Kevin, uh, your thoughts on whether closures across the country um, potentially further harm the relationship between families and childcare, um, such that families may not return to centers due to the instability that they've experienced. Um, and the individual also asked, how do we rebuild trust as things reopen, as programs and providers um, reopen? How do we establish trust with families? Yeah, I, I appreciate those questions and I'm, I'm gonna draw on the one project I presented and we're also currently speaking to community-based organizations in North Carolina about um, Latino-based community-based organizations. Um, and, and I think that's gonna inform some of what I said. So if, the, if I understood the first question about the breakdown of potentially relationships, I, I have to admit in my interviews with family and my conversations, as well as just my general exposure to families looking for child care is that families, as we saw throughout, were continuing looking for new arrangements that met their needs. And that often that meant multiple strategies arrangements throughout the pandemic. So I don't think families relation, I don't necessarily think that trust has been broken in that I think many families, because of the necessity, are going to be looking for new arrangements and arrangements that work for them. That said, from these same set of interviews, and again, we're only, um, we've only completed a preliminary analysis, I do think that the relationships that providers or even systems like uh, subsidy systems have with families are ones that can be strengthened with Latino families. And particularly there are ways, I think, through using the resource network. I had, you know, I, I remember distinctly two different families telling me something along the lines of like, these systems are not built for Latino families, like the idea that you might have to sign up for a waiting list and know the exact date to sign up for a waiting list uh, for certain centers, or that there were many people who didn't know and they they spoke that they only were connected to Early Head Start through a promoter model in the local playground. So borrowing from health promoter models of folks going out in the community and talking about different options, another parent approached her and, and gave her information about Early Head Start and that availability for families. And I heard from both community-based organizations and some families that we need to be doing more things like that. Go to the places where these families are and talk to them in, in the channels that they know how, that they're familiar with about um, the, the types of care that is available to them and the programs that are available to them, whether that's food banks, churches, local organizations, or just the playgrounds in their neighborhoods. Thank you. Well, as we... We're running out of time. I just wanted to say my thanks to the entire panel and for the audience for joining us in this conversation. I think I'm going to turn it back over to Maria. Yes, thank you so much to our panelists and our audience. Um, I'd looks, also like to um, thank our funder at the Office of Planning, Research and Evaluation and the Administration for Children and Families and the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. And um, please um, go to our website and tweet and email us if you have any questions. And we hope you have a very great day. Thank you so much for joining us today.